Well, hi again, Mr. Bleeker here. We're moving into lesson four, which is the organization of the nervous system. This lesson focuses on the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So we should talk about what we mean when we say those two terms. Now, your central nervous system is comprised of your brain and your spinal cord. And of course, central to our survival, the judgments we make, Remember the medulla oblongata, located right here, is responsible for keeping your heart beating. It's also responsible for keeping your lungs inflating and deflating. Fairly central to our survival. Now when signals are sent from the brain, they're sent outwards to the periphery. So when you look at these bundles right here, these nerves, they're called peripheral nerves and there's really two types there's ones that lead away from the central nervous system and there's ones that lead towards the central nervous system the ones that lead away cause an effect for example if I wanted to squeeze a ball in my hand that's an effector uh, an effector nerve and if I put my hand down on a hot stove I would have a sensory nerve so sensory nerves take information to the central nervous system where effectory nerves or effector nerves lead away from your central nervous system. We should look at those nerve bundles by the way. If we look up close it, it looks almost like fiber optic connections where we have lots and lots of the axons and you can see them here bundled up with connective tissue leading uh, for example we'll call this um, tissue that would be say in the spinal cord it's not just one nerve cell what I'm trying to convey here is it's actually collections of them so when you look at the axon here um, that's a, a very long majority of what you'll see sort of in these nerve cell bundles okay now into the action moment here the nervous system as we said we've got the the central nervous system comprised of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system, which is everything leading away from and towards the brain and the spinal cord. So the peripheral nervous system itself is a little bit more complex. There's, there's more to look at there. And what we'll be studying is that the peripheral nervous system has uh, the, the nerves that lead out to your uh, muscles and your skin and things like that. We say that that is somatic. So there's two divisions you have to know for the peripheral nervous system. Somatic, which means body, comes from the Latin word soma. So that tends to be voluntary. And another one called the autonomic. Now, uh, here's a little uh, piece of advice. Think of automatic because peripheral nerves that lead out to for example, our organs and our glands, um, think of your heart, your lungs, even salivary glands. This comes under automatic control. And I, I like to jo joke that it's a good thing you don't have to think about breathing. And the, the inside joke there is what I'm talking about are the automatic or the autonomic peripheral nerves that control our organs and our glands. That's far too complex to think about. For example, when you eat food, it should just be automatic. You shouldn't have to command from your central nervous system. There shouldn't be a signal that's sent out saying, hey, salivary glands produce saliva. It just needs to happen automatically. That's just in our better interest of survival. So when, when you go study the nervous system, you need to know this diagram. Peripheral or PNS, central or CNS. It's the peripheral where you have to do the heavy lifting and the work. Autonomic and somatic. Somatic is voluntary control, so that's muscular control. Think of it, that's easier. Autonomic will be looking at two divisions. Because if you tell muscles and glands to do something, you might want to think that you kind of have a, a ramping up phase where um, you tell those um, glands to do their thing. And you might want to have a calming down phase. And the way these are referred to, the arousing phase is 
sympathetic to your cause. In other words, action is about to happen. So sympathetic is arousing, where parasympathetic is the opposite. These terms can sometimes be a little problematic for students, but um, here's an easy way I've always told my students to remember it. If, for example, you feel your life is in danger and your autonomic nervous system turns on your adrenal glands, that is sympathetic to your survival. And that's a great way to remember it. Now, once all that adrenaline is done and you have to come down from that adrenaline high, there's got to be something that opposes the sympathetic portion of your uh, uh, autonomic nervous system. We call that parasympathetic. But we'll get into that in greater detail. In your study notes, you should have this as an overview. And you really are going to be working on this branch in particular. OK, so um, just kind of go to our, our notes portion here just briefly. Um, make sure we're ready to go. There we go. And. give you a few action items here. There we go. So the peripheral nervous system um, has nerves that lead away from the central nervous system um, and towards the central nervous system. So I wanted to provide that bit of clarity. Um, when you think about axons that lead towards the central nervous system, um, you may recall in the, uh, um, when we were studying the um, kidney, we brought in these terms afferent and efferent. So all they really mean, afferent comes, oh, pen went to sleep, there we go. Afferent, think of the letter A, comes first. So we'll think of coming towards the central nervous system, right, as being afferent. And conversely, we'll think of efferent, or the second choice, as those that are leading away from the central nervous system. Okay, so case in point, the afferent ones are sensory, whereas the efferent are leading away, and those are, think of those as motor neurons. And of course, those go out to our muscles and glands. There we go. Sort of create action there. So when you look at the organization of the spine, just a little moment here, um, you're looking uh, as if you're looking at someone's belly. That's what we're saying is ventral. And the if you look at it up closely, you know that those nerves have to come out from little spots in the um, in the uh, through the vertebrae, and that can, those can sometimes get compressed and um, as they come out, they come out through what are called roots. So I'll do my best here. And they'll come out through what are called um, ganglia. So depending whether they come out dorsally or ventrally, I won't draw it exactly, but the nerves will lead out. And of course, the nerves can also lead in. Sort of get the idea. I'll just draw in just in a posing fashion. Not accurate, but just give you the idea leading out and leading in. And if those nerves are compromised, you can get um, some very painful conditions. When they talk about a slipped disc, for example, if one of these discs bulge and applies pressure, if that disc bulges outwards like that and creates pressure, um, what you can have is pain on adjacent nerves and that can create sciatica, which is a, a really bad pain you'll feel uh, leading down the leg. It's quite torturous feels like the back of your leg is on fire. But there's there's only a certain amount of room for the nerves to emerge from the from the spine. So it the spinal alignment is very important. And that's the better part of chiropractic. Chiropractic care, that is. Here this does a little bit better of a job kind of showing it, right? Where we see on the there's nerve clusters. And some of my students that have been in uh, uh, biology eleven kind of familiar with a little bit of this where they're saying oh that's kind of interesting right here's those ganglia again 
right? Which are these little sort of clusters. Here's a here's a dorsal root ganglion here, right, towards the dorsal side, and you can see it uh, leading in there. It's sort of the little connections. And this tissue here, which are ganglia, are just major clusters of nerves. And of course, they can get pinched, cause all kinds of problems. Um, as you study the central nervous system and also the peripheral nervous system, you'll learn that there are um, uh, there are ganglia in some cases that um, lead away from the spine, or there can be ganglia. Um, just outside of the spine. We're not going to focus on that so much. I just want you to know those nerve clusters near the spine. I think that's a little bit more important. Interesting when you take a look through uh, a cross section of the spinal cord, um, this is where I've kind of been itching to tell you that, the sp the, that your central nervous system itself is triple plied. Um, we have to protect these nerves sort of at all cost. And there's three major layers or bags to the nervous system. So we're going to take a little take a little look here and do the best we can. Um, when you look at the wrap around here, it's not so obvious. There needs to be some kind of a wrap to protect, to keep the germs away from this. Because you don't, uh, for all intents and purposes, you don't have a lot of uh, immune fighting that goes on then in the nervous system. You don't expect the white blood cells really to come to your rescue. The central nervous system tissue is wrapped and kept away from invaders. Now that's not to say that you can't get um, invaders in your central nervous system. If you do, they draw if they draw fluid, spinal fluid from this area and it's cloudy, you've got a bacterial infection, which is a major problem because your central nervous system can't really get in here very well. If they do a spinal tap and pull the fluid out and it's clear, um, you could be suffering from something, for example, like back, uh, viral meningitis, which is much better. You don't want bacteria in here. They will just go to town and eat your tissue. So that is not good. Not good at all. Okay. So you had the first layer was here, of course. And then there is a second area out here. And it's kind of webby. If you look at it kind of up close, it has this sort of, and I'll just draw it off to the side. It has this interesting kind of appearance here. And we say it looks web-like, so we say that's the arachnoid membrane. So our first, just to sort of back up here, our first inner layer right there is known as our pia mater. Then it goes to our, let's actually, let's erase that. There we go. So number one, the pyomater. Number two, your arachnoid layer, which provides you even more sort of uh, protection from germs and such in the environment. And three, you have your duramater, which is right here. And it's that final sort of outer wrap that you see kind of along here, which is protective. So you've got one there, you've got another one here, and you've got your inner layer right there going around the inside. So you are quite um, you are quite protected in a great number of respects with the triple ply layer that you see, sort of what I'm trying to sort of scribble in. So those are three major layers of protection. Pyomater, arachnoid, and duramater. And I think it's best just to take it from the from the inside and work your way out. Okay, just making sure that my recording is still going. Sometimes, there we go. Sometimes it stops recording and I don't even know it. But that's okay. Now, I always it, it always strikes when you look at the... Um, 
spinal cord and with the ganglia coming off to the side, the ganglia specifically being here, right? And another one over here. And this does a good job of showing um, the, there's your dura mater and then there's your arachnoid space there. And then the pia mater, which is the inner, whoops, the inner wrap, which is, uh, I'll indicate with a little dot there. Now remember when you look at the tissue of the spinal cord, remember that there's white matter and gray matter. White, uh, white matter tends to be the insulated uh, nerves where the signal has to travel further, right? And it's insulated so the signal can jump. We've talked about that before. Do the saltatory conduction. And then you've got the interneurons, largely which are the gray matter, which are just the little switcher nerves, if you want to think of it that way. Um, often uh, what they do is they take the signal from a sensory nerve and switch it over to a motor nerve. So um, when you feel pain, they'll do an automatic switch. So you pull your hand away from the hot stove. Handy that that's built in that way. Of course, there's some nerves that go up to your brain and also tell you that you felt the pain. Okay. Now we'll get into the really quite important aspect here is the divisions of the peripheral nervous system. So your peripheral nervous system, as you recall, let's just bring up a vision here. Your peripheral nervous system is shown here in green. It's all these nerves that lead out um, away from and alternatively back to your central nervous system. So what you've got is um, this region here, but you have to say, okay, what do they do? Do they just help my muscles flex? That's somatic. Or are they helping with the involuntary stuff, which is the automatic, I mean, autonomic nervous system? Kind of gets interesting when you start to consider it here. So in overview, let's go to full screen. There we go. Somatic. Okay, so please remember the word soma, right? And it's pretty much voluntary, right? Movement of skeletal muscles, you can control that. Um, transmits uh, sensory information back to the central nervous system, okay? And it's it tends to be us interacting with our environment in a, in a voluntary way. You open your eyes in the morning, there you go. But the autonomic nervous system isn't, isn't where you're um, sort of controlling your, your uh, muscles or things like that. that. That's not what we're really talking about there. This is where we're thinking automatic. So your smooth muscle, I'll point that one out. It's because the, if, you're in the hospital, for example, and if you've been, uh, let's say that you've been in the hospital for a while due to an injury, they'll listen with a stethoscope to the sound of your innards and it, they'll specifically put it down in your belly and they'll listen to hear the muscles and see if they're still pushing food along, right? It's good to get a patient up and moving because that helps food move through the digestive system. That's all smooth muscle. You don't even think about the contractions of the food going through your digestive system. You don't think either about your cardiac muscle squeezing and your heart beating. And you don't think about salivation, it just happens. So when we look at the autonomic nervous system, we have to think, we have to go into what I was referring to before, which is your uh, sympathetic one and think of an adrenaline rush here, for example, because that's, that's really, really involuntary. And then there's the coming down, right, which is the parasympathetic, which is, of course, it, it's involuntary too, but we'll look really carefully at how these two divisions, subdivisions of the autonomic nervous system work. So somatic is pretty easy. Um, now, the autonomic one warrants much more attention. And if you've ever heard of the term, um, the, f the flight or fr uh, the um, fight or flight response, more formally known these days as fright, as in being afraid, fright or flight, um, 
those are kind of the two uh, that you want to think of here. If you're afraid of public speaking, you can blame your autonomic nervous system because it gears up um, your sympathetic nervous uh, subdivision and you start to feel all this sort of anxiety. And that's your autonomic nervous system, folks. Just trying to protect you. Okay, so let's paint a scenario. Uh, let's say you're out for a run. And um, as has actually happened to me, you're out for a run and we, I was at UVic and a bunny rabbit ran, there was lots of rabbits at the time, and it ran in front of me in the path, and a moment later, a cougar ran after it. Now, it really freaked out a friend of mine who, uh, you know, was, was uh, basically going into shock afterwards, but we both experienced that huge rush, right? So the somatic nervous system, which is, uh, of course, uh, your muscles, and it's, but it's also your um, your senses, right? Somatic nervous system, the bodily one out there, okay? It's picking up danger. And that somatic nervous system, um, these are all connected. The somatic nervous system makes the autonomic nervous system kick, kick in. So there's an auto, automatic response. Now, as far as the automatic response, you're not going to be coming down when you experience this. This would be like if you were in a car crash. Your autonomic sympathetic gears up. And it's going to automatically tell the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are going to get a very quick signal, a stimulating signal that epinephrine is needed, right? If you're going to, uh, for example, uh, fight for your life against a large cat like this or um, brace yourself for the impact of a car, um, your autonomic nervous system is making your sympathetic uh, do a, a lion's amount of work. And that's important because it's trying to keep you alive. So for if your adrenal glands squeeze, now remember where your adrenal glands are, they're on top of the kidneys and they will release uh, adrenaline pretty well straight into the um, vena cava that goes to the heart and wham it's everywhere in the body quickly now being in a car crash i remember um, being aware of everything the dash crumpling towards me just like when i saw um when i was at u uvic and i saw the the cat run in front of me i could remember it taking strides it's kind of an amazing thing about well about about one stride but that was more than enough now we need to look at at what happens there's heightened senses, of course, right? And you sort of go into battle mode, right? Survival mode. Speed uh, becomes higher. Um, the eyes dilate to take in as much light as possible. Strength increases drastically, but we kind of have to look at why. At this point, your body's trying to make a decision. <laughs> Basically, should I stay in battle or should I run for my life? The problem is, is when you get stuck, um, if you get stuck trying to make the decision that's obviously not in your survival interest. Nowadays, um, being you, you do get stuck because you, if, for example, if you go to do public speaking and you stand up in front of a whole group of people and you just freeze, um, that's where you're caught at the whole or point between, uh, f uh, in this case we're using the older term, flight or fight. Um, anxiety makes it feel like you're gearing up for this kind of sort of warfare. So let's take a peek a little bit further into what we're talking about here. Okay, so again, there's our central nervous system, right? Somatic sensory nerves and motor nerves. So this is uh, just bodily interaction stuff, right? Mostly about motor function. And then there's our automatic or autonomic one with sympathetic and parasympathetic. And of course, it's a two-way interaction. So what do we got? Um, ah, this is the one I wanted to show you. So when your sympathetic nervous system kicks in, we'll look at this scenario, what happens? Okay, so your sympathetic nervous system uh, tends to be housed um, here, and it's going to send signals out here, and you'll, you'll notice that these are ganglia, for example right now we won't focus too much on those 
what I want you to know is that in your sympathetic nervous system, you're going to ramp up. So dilation completely makes sense. You want to take in as much light as possible to see what's going on. So your pupils uh, will be maximally exposed, right, as your iris uh, dilates, the colored part of your eye. At this point, for example, secretions, like think about uh, if you've ever been really scared, you get dry mouth, decrease secretions. Right now, the digestive system has about as much to do with your survival as uh, basically your chance of landing on the moon without a spacecraft. None. So turn off the secretions. They don't matter right now. You want to get the cardiac output up. You want to get blood, nutrients, oxygen, things like that um, pumping around the body. You want to increase the ventilation. Definitely aligned with your sympathetic. You want to... Um, Increase blood flow to the liver. Now, the reason why the liver is the biggest storehouse of glycogen, get that, get those nutrients into the blood as fast as possible. Okay, because you need to increase blood glucose like crazy. This represents the gut and the viscera here. Now, it also shows down here, zoom in on this, the skin. And at this point, you know what? We're going to take a little bit of blood away from the skin and we're going to send it to the muscles because that is going to make us a lot stronger. And this is where you'll hear, for example, about um, people under the influence of adrenaline. Um, that's definitely a sympathetic nervous system uh, stimulant. And these are the kind of things that happen to our major organs, the ones that will help us um, in a fight or flight response get attention by the sympathetic nervous system. The ones that don't really get turned off. So now over here, I took the, the honor of just kind of doing this a little bit earlier just to speed things along. When you come down, now in the cases of shock, it's hard for a person's um, parasympathetic nervous system to bring us back from the edge you have to undo all this stuff that's happened to the body. And I remember the effects of adrenaline when I was in a car crash. I was just jacked and it was, it, I was just shivering, just shaking, right? And your body has to undo that level of activity. So the pupils, uh, basically there had to be constriction. Okay, so my pupils didn't need to be, you know, the, the size of coins, okay? And the dry mouth went away, started to... <laughs> It didn't feel like I'd been eating crackers all day long. Um, your heart rate will slow down. Your, bre your breathing rate, it'll slow down too, right? You don't need so much oxygen. You're not going to war. You're not running for your life. Uh, if you've ever felt scared, you felt that cold sensation in the pit of your gut, that's your liver. And that's a, that's a massive release of glycogen when you're uh, freaked out. I'll just use the term. But once you come back from that, the blood flow to the liver will sort of normalize and decrease and you'll be fine. Um, your blood glucose will uh, decrease as a result of that. And you can get, um, your gut will start to receive uh, blood again because it's normal activity for the body to, you know, regulate its uh, uh, nutrient levels. So these will go back to the way they were. If you've ever played hide and seek, the reason why you felt like you had to go to the bathroom was because if you think about down here, a lot of this, um, uh, we're in sympathetic here. Ooh, we should have decreased blood flow there. Ha, I'll fix that. Um, if you're running for your life, your stomach and intestines here, they don't. it's not really important. Uh, you may even vomit. And you'll, you will feel like you have to go to the bathroom because stim your bladder is... is basically being stimulated in a way that's like empty. It's the last thing your body's really concerned about. But when you come back, um, that all has to be um, undone. So the blood flow to this is increased. So I made that fix there. I didn't realize I had that on my previous slide. So there you go. Your parasympathetic nervous system undoes the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system of Remember, these are both part of the autonomic nervous system. And that's a part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Isn't it great? Well, that's okay. That's what we're here for. We're 
laying out the path. Okay, so I'm just going to jump back to um, our notes. Just a sec here. Leave your iPad for t this long and it just locks you out. That's okay. There we go. And we're back. Good. So this this response, you, you've probably experienced this at one point in your life. The whole reason uh, hide and seek is so much fun is because you gear up your uh, autonomic nervous system, specifically your sympathetic division. It makes the game fun, right? That tension, that anxiety, it just kills us. But our anxiety could be a problem where our sympathetic nervous system is geared up too much. Now, if you go into shock, it's hard to get back to the way you started. So your, your parasympathetic nervous system has trouble bringing you back and you have to, we have to calm you down. So a nice overview here. Um, in this lesson, I've gone over it, but here you can see the uh, one, one notable thing I will mention now, now that you can kind of see the, the idea here of what is stimulating or bringing each, uh, sympathetic is stimulating, parasympathetic is bringing you back specifically. The sympathetic nervous system, let's just get our highlighter here, if you notice, the sympathetic nervous system sort of originates from sort of thoracic tissue here, right? That's about kind of in the middle of your back. Whereas your parasympathetic nervous system, you'll notice um, it's sacral and it's originating from sort of the, uh, uh, just the, kind of just above your cervical vertebrae, um, just there in the brain. So interesting when you look at where the nerves are originating from. A slide like this makes very good sort of test material because it points out, for example, what the sympathetic nervous system would do. For example, um, dilating your pupils, inhibiting salivation, increasing your airflow, increasing the heart rate, cranking up glucose production taking blood away from the skin because there's a better place for it to be, turning off the digestive system because who really cares about food in your stomach when you're fighting for your life, and so on and so forth. Okay. On this side, you'll see the corrections. Right. Each of the corrections is going to be made to undo what has been done. Okay, so take a look at that. Um, I'll, I provided you with the information. We've already gone over it. Okay. Neat, uh, neat sort of view of the adrenal medulla. Of course, remember the adrenal glands are sitting right on top of your kidneys. The medulla, of course, is the sort of central region. And it's fascinating because when you look at it, it is nervous tissue. Now, one kind of thing that you probably haven't um, realized at this point in the course it's kind of strange to have nervous tissue outside of the central nervous system. What I'll tell you about the adrenal medulla is it's producing a hormone and hormones aren't that much different than neurotransmitters. So it's very intriguing that we have tissue outside of the central nervous system, which is secreting hormones, which are a lot like neurotransmitters. So there's a link between hormones and neurotransmitters is basically what I'm trying to tell you. They're kind of uh, very similar, if not outright the same thing. Uh, hormones and neurotransmitters can act differently in the brain as they do in the body. What I'll tell you about adrenaline, adrenaline itself, um, also known as epinephrine, has these effects where it cranks up your airways or dilates them, cardiac output. Muscles become, of course, much stronger and efficient because they're getting increased blood flow coming, uh, well, uh, there's, it's like a tsunami of blood coming in because you're getting blood that isn't going to your digestive system anymore. Not only are, um, not only are, is uh, glycogen from the liver being liberated, but you're going to burn fats and fat itself is a huge store of energy. Your mental alertness is vastly increased because of blood flow to the brain 
and you'll feel like it's almost it, like these movies where they they I've talked about lately where you're able to access more than 10% of your brain. I, I laugh at where the 10% number comes from. I've never actually seen a statistic on that, but I've heard it enough times. Um, because of all the nutrients, because of the blood flow, your mental sharpness is just about as good as it can get, which means that your reaction time, your nerves, your muscles, you have Spider-Man reflexes. Glycogenesis, that just means release of glycogen from the liver, and your digestive system, who cares? That gets shut off. It, it has very little to do with your survival at this point. There you go. So a nice little shot of the adrenal gland. Um, we're looking at um, the medulla. The cortex has, has more to do with, um, if you think about our, uh, in our previous lectures, we were talking about aldosterone and raising your, your uh, blood pressure should it be needed if your uh, if your blood pressure is drastically low from say being cut, but the adrenal medulla um, that's got a whole bunch of sympathetic nerve fibers leading into it, and if they tell it to secrete epinephrine, that's exactly what it's going to do. And look at where it is. You might notice, hey, that's probably where the blood's going to go. Here's some more whoosh up to the heart we go way up here to get sent around into in basically into systemic flow so the parasympathetic nervous system just a quick trip around that that's your chilled relaxed state chilling right feels good nutrients your body starts to build up its stores again that's to be expected the old juices are flowing your guts are working properly. And this is you uh, really, say, two to three hours after that car accident when you've calmed down. So parasympathetic nervous system, as I've said, has to undo all that damage. Remember that it is a subdivision of the autonomic, which is why this is kind of indented the way it is here. Okay, a little creative highlighting by me. Yes, there's that purple color again. But I like it. Um, we've already seen this, so I'll move on. Just a couple of close-up shots here, really, of, of what's happening. Um, and that leads to our next topic, which is the brain. So at this point, I will stop. Um, wanted to give you, oops, there it is. I wanted to give you an overview, come back here, of this. The peripheral nervous system, because that's really what this is all being about. Central nervous system, that's pretty easy. That's one you know. But this peripheral nervous system one, that's the one you really need to study. But it is fascinating because you've known about this your whole life. Now we've just put it in a scheme. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for another one. Thanks for listening. Ciao.